We don't think we hate cheap things, but we frequently behave as if we rather do. Consider the pineapple. Columbus was the first European to be delighted by its physical grandeur and vibrant sweetness. He brought some back to Europe, but pineapples proved extremely difficult to transport and very costly to cultivate. For a long time, only royalty could afford to eat them. Russia's Catherine the Great was a huge fan, as was Charles II of England. A single fruit in the 17th century sold for today's equivalent of £5,000. The pineapple was so exciting and so loved that in 1761 the fourth Earl of Dunmore built a temple on his Scottish estate in its honour. And Christopher Wren had no hesitation in topping the South Tower of St Paul's in London with this evidently divine fruit. Then, at the very end of the 19th century, two things changed. Large commercial plantations of pineapples were established in Hawaii, and there were huge advances in steamship technology. Transport costs plummeted and unwittingly transformed the psychology of pineapple eating. Today, you can get a pineapple for around a pound fifty. It still tastes exactly the same. But now, the pineapple is one of the world's least glamorous fruits. It's never served at smart dinner parties, and it would never be carved on top of a major civic building. The pineapple itself hasn't changed, only our attitude to it has. Contemplation of the history of the pineapple suggests a curious overlap between love and economics. When we have to pay a lot for something nice, we appreciate it to the full. Yet, as its price in the market falls, passion has a habit of fading away. Naturally, if the object has no merit to begin with, a high price won't be able to do anything for it. But if it has real virtue and yet a low price, then it's in severe danger of falling into neglect. It's a pattern that we see recurring in a range of areas. For example, with a sight of clouds from above. In 1927, a hitherto unknown airmail pilot called Charles Lindbergh became the first man to complete a solo crossing of the Atlantic in his plane, The Spirit of St. Louis. He was awestruck and felt he was becoming, for a time, almost godlike. For most of the 20th century, his experience remained rare and extremely costly. There was therefore never any danger that the human value of crossing an ocean by air would be overlooked but this lasted only until the arrival of the Boeing 747 and the cheap plane ticket in the summer of 1970. Now, almost no one looks out of the plane window anymore. Why then do we associate cheap prices with a lack of value? Our response seems a hangover from our long pre-industrial past. For most of human history, there truly was a strong correlation between cost and value. The higher the price, the better things tended to be, because there was simply no way both for prices to be low and quality high. Everything had to be made by hand, by expensively trained artisans, with raw materials that were immensely difficult to transport. The expensive sword, jacket, window or wheelbarrow were simply always the better ones. This relationship between price and value held true in an uninterrupted way until the end of the 18th century, when, thanks to the Industrial Revolution, something extremely unusual happened. Human beings worked out how to make high-quality goods at cheap prices because of technology and new methods of organising the labour force. However, despite the greatness of these efforts, instead of making wonderful experiences universally available, industrialization has inadvertently produced a different effect. It seemed to rob certain experiences of their loveliness, interest and worth. It's not, of course, that we refuse to buy inexpensive or cheap things. It's just that getting excited over cheap things has come to seem a little bizarre. One is allowed to get very worked up over the eggs of the sturgeon, a hundred pounds for a small pot, but we have to be very circumscribed about one's enthusiasm for the eggs of a chicken, 12 for two pounds. There is an intimidating hierarchy operating in the background, shaping what we're allowed to be grateful for and feel that we lack and must have. The price tells us something very special is going on here, but it may be going on in the cheaper thing too. How do we reverse this? The answer lies in a slightly unexpected area, the mind of a four-year-old. Here he is with a puddle. It started raining an hour ago. Now the street is full of puddles and there could be nothing better in the world. The riches of the Indies would be nothing next to the pleasures of being able to see the rippling of the water created by a jump in one's boots. The eddies and whirlpools, the minute waves, the oceans beneath one, it's all fascinating. Children have great advantages. 
They don't know what they're supposed to like, and they don't understand money. So price is never a guide of value for them. They'll spend an hour with one button. One buys them the £49 wooden toy made by Swedish artisans and finds that they prefer the cardboard box that it came in. They prefer the nail and screw section of a DIY shop to the fanciest toy department. A child might be deeply surprised, even shocked, to learn that a USB stick can be had for just over one pound. Children would be right if prices were determined by human worth and value, but they're not. They just reflect what things cost to make. The pity is, therefore, that we do treat them as a guide to what matters, when this isn't what a financial price should ever be used for. We can't directly go back to childhood, but we have got people who can help us in this area. Artists. They are the experts at recording and communicating their enthusiasms, which, like children, can take them in slightly unexpected directions. The French artist Paul Cézanne spent a good deal of the late 19th century painting groups of apples in his studio in Provence. He was thrilled by their texture, shapes and colours. He loved the transitions between the yellowy golds and the deep reds across their skins. Cézanne had all the awe, love and excitement before the apple that aristocrats once had for the pineapple. Cézanne in his studio was generating his own revolution, not an industrial revolution that would make once costly objects available to everyone, but a revolution in appreciation, a far deeper process that could get us to notice what we already have to hand. Instead of reducing prices, he was raising levels of appreciation, which is a move that's perhaps more precious to us economically, because it means that we can suddenly get a lot more great things for very little money. We need to rethink our relationship to prices. We've been looking at prices in the wrong way. We fetishise them as tokens of intrinsic value. We've allowed them to set how much excitement we're allowed to have in given areas. But prices were never meant to be like this. We're breathing too much life into them and therefore dulling too many of our responses to the inexpensive world. We are, astonishingly, already a good deal richer than we're encouraged to think we are.